Hello everyone, I am Rahul Gosain. And I'm Rohit Gosain. And we are Oncology Brothers. Rohit, we've seen so many drug approvals already in 2023. And as a general medical oncologist, we have to keep up with all of these advances. To focus on one of these approvals in metastatic hormone receptor positive breast cancer, we now have Alicestrant. Rohit, what are you looking forward to in this conversation and who do we have with us today? Alicestrant, well, the first oral CERD, selective estrogen receptor degrader, while first line, we already know that in endocrine sensitive patient population, we tend to rely on CDK4-6 inhibitor along with endocrine therapy. Following that in second line, we had Fulvent, where single agent therapy itself is about two to three months, not that robust. As a result, Alicestrin came into action. Now, to talk about this further, we're joined by Dr. Virginia Kaklamani, who was one of the co-authors of Emerald Trial that has led to the approval of this drug itself. Thank you, Dr. Kaklamani, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Perfect. Diving into this further deeper, what is exactly Alicestrin? So elicestrant, as you mentioned, is an oral CERD, so it's an elective estrogen receptor downregulator, a degrader. Um, and what it does is it basically binds the estrogen receptor and it really degrades it uh, for a better, for a lack of better, better um, um, uh, term. And what we found in the phase one trial that we performed was that elicestrant was active in all kinds of settings. It was active in patients after having uh, had progression of disease with a CDK4-6 inhibitor, active in patients that had been on an aromatase inhibitor, and active in patients that had been on a full fulvestrant and had, again, progression of disease on fulvestrant. So, Dr. Kaklamani, looking at the trial design when it comes to Emerald study, what was the inclusion criteria? Because these are the patients that I have to worry about as a general medical oncologist. So who were selected in this and who benefited? So the patients that were included in Emerald were patients that had metastatic, hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative breast cancer that had been on a previous uh, line of therapy with a CDK4-6 inhibitor and had disease progression on a CDK4-6 inhibitor. Patients could have received up to one line of chemotherapy and also patients could have received either an aromatase inhibitor or fulvestrant uh, prior to enrollment on Emerald. Now, as you'll see on Emerald, the standard of care arm had either an aromatase inhibitor or fulvestrant, and this was investigator's choice. However, the protocol mandated that the investigator took into account what prior endocrine therapy the patient had received. So if the patient had received an AI, they would receive fulvestrant. If they had received fulvestrant, they'd receive an AI. And then particularly the other thing that uh, we were also looking as part of inclusion criteria was making sure that these patients were also stratif stratified based on ESR1 mutation. That is correct. There was data not just from this CERD, but from other CERDs that they're more active in patients that have tumors with ESR1 mutations. And so even though we didn't just include patients with uh, ESR1 mutated tumors, we did stratify for that. Good. Thanks for mentioning that because the approval itself is for ESR1 mutation positive patients. Now, talking about the ESR1 mutation, do you rely on the liquid biopsy on that or rather solid tissue where you have to rebiopsy these patients to determine the ESR1 mutational status and then consider them for elicestrant? So ESR1 mutations are actually a little different from several other mutations that we look at, for example, PIK3CA mutations. PIK3CA mutations are present in the primary tumor, and so they're early events. But ESR1 mutations develop over time in patients whose cancer becomes more and more endocrine resistant. And so it's important that we test not the primary tumor, because we're likely not going to find an ESR1 mutation, but we test, and, and in most cases on the protocol, with a liquid biopsy to see the development of an ESR1 mutation. That is such an important point. As a general medical oncologist, we're getting more and more used to the liquid biopsy, and it's easier, less invasive for our patients and that when we're talking about when or how to test it, we have to make sure that we appreciate that this is a resistant mutation and you need to test it once the patients have progressed on their primary line rather than what we tend to see for PIK3CA. The ESR1 mutations are mutations in the ligand 
binding domain of the estrogen receptor gene. What does that mean? That means that it changes the conformation of that ligand binding domain and it makes the ER constitutively active. That means that the ER doesn't need estrogen anymore and it doesn't get blocked by tamoxifen, it doesn't get blocked by the lack of estrogen. And so it's active all the time. And what we found with these mutations is that medications like fulvestrant can be a little bit more um, specific and can have more effects on, on, on tumors with ESR1 mutations compared to aromatase inhibitors. And these oral surds in general tend to be even more effective in tumors with ESR1 mutations uh, um, compared to fulvestrant and definitely compared to aromatase inhibitors. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Kaklamani. So just to reiterate what we have so far, this again was in second line. We're focused on ESR1 mutation, which is a resistant gene mutation. Is it fair to say that as high as 50% of the patients can have ESR1 mutation, Dr. Kaklamani? Uh, so so at clarification, this was not really second line. This is a global trial. So if you look at the US, many of the patients that participated were patients that had previously been on a CDK46 inhibitor first line, and then they were going on the medication. But a lot of patients in Europe were receiving it as third or even fourth line, and some patients were receiving it after having received chemotherapy as well. And so that's why when you look at the results, you have to take that into account, because obviously when we look at efficacy, even of the control arm of less than two months, we have to take into account the fact that some of these patients had already received chemotherapy. And I think that's Absolutely. where the FDA approval sort of is easier to interpret because it says at least one line of therapy doesn't really restrict. It has to be endocrine therapy to begin with. That's exactly correct. Now, when we were designing the trial, we expected around 40 percent of the patients to have an ESR1 mutated tumor. And initially when the trial uh, uh, kicked off, more patients were accrued in Europe. And therefore, for, for, for some reason, the, the mutation rate was less than 20%. And so huh. thankfully the US accrual started picking up and we got to, I think, 46% or so mutation carriers. Uh, but uh, but there, was, there did seem to be a difference between the European and the, the U.S. population. And the thought that we had was that maybe it had to do with the differences in the use of aromatase inhibitors, the use of CDK46 inhibitors in these two different uh, parts of the world. Oh, wow. That's very interesting. That's very interesting. So, Dr. Kaklamani, based on our inclusion criteria and the treatment arm, what did the study show? So the study had two primary endpoints. The first was the progression-free survival in the whole patient population, and the second one was progression-free survival in the patient population with mutated uh, ESR1 uh, uh, tumors. And what it showed was that in both sets of patients, there was a significant improvement in median PFS with elisastrant compared to standard of care endocrine therapy. When looking at the patients that seemed to benefit the most, those really were the patients with tumors with ESR1 mutations, which is why the FDA approved it in this patient population. In the, in the patient population without ESR1 mutations, there seemed to be little difference between the drugs. But having said that, elisastrant performed as well as our standard of care endocrine therapy in the non-mutated patient population. No, that's exciting because um, the results that we have received, especially when you talk about the patients who are hormone sensitive patients, especially 12 months or 18 months, their patients on elicestrant really did well. Now, how do you define hormone sensitive? Because we truly don't have a particular definition for that, whether it's three months, six months, 12 months or 18 months. We really don't. And this was our attempt to define uh, the endocrine sensitive patient population with prior CDK46 inhibitor exposure. And thankfully, we had the data for that. And so we looked at all of these different time points, and it seemed that where I think Elisastrin performed the best was in the patients that had been on a prior CDK46 inhibitor for at least 12 months. And there really didn't seem to be much of a difference between 12 and 18 months. But again, take into account the fact that patients could have been on a CDK46 inhibitor in the first line setting or the second line setting. And so when you look at that 12 month, you have to take that with a grain of salt. 
And just to add, Dr. Kakamani, thank you so much for covering that. But also, as you mentioned, that for the approval, now it is for ESR1 mutant patients. When these patients have already exhausted multiple lines of chemotherapy or already beaten down, now giving an oral option in an ESR1 non-mutant patient, would you consider this drug at all as an option? I would consider this drug in a patient population that I would want to give endocrine therapy to. And, and okay. the good thing is that we are all clinicians and we have to use our clinical judgment. And we know that some patients that have been on endocrine therapy that have been on chemotherapy and maybe their performance status is not great to receive that fourth or fifth line of chemotherapy, but they still want endocrine therapy or some sort of therapy. We have to look at our options and our options are going to be, do we want to go back to tamoxifen? Do we want to go back to fulvestrant? And if they've already received those drugs, maybe giving elocestrant is a, is a good option. But remember, the, the way the FDA approved the drug was only in ESR1 mutated tumors. Certainly. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Kakamani, we know that some of these patients will also have co-mutation of PIK3CA. How common is it to have both ESR1 and PIK3CA mutation? And if it is something that you see, what are you going to use? Alicestrin or alprilisib? What will be your treatment there? So um, I don't know that I have the exact number, but the, the, the rate of PIK3CA mutations is 30%. The rate of ESR1 mutations is 40%. And I don't know that there's a different, there's a, there's a, a reason to believe that if a tumor is, is mutated for one, it won't be mutated for another or the other way around because those two phenomena are independent. Um, now, if a, if, a, if a patient's cancer is mutated for both, we really have to make a decision as to what the quality of life is going to be. We know that alpelisib can have uh, hyperglycemia, diarrhea, stomatitis, rash as, as toxicities. And for some patients, this may actually be pretty difficult to take. So giving yep. two drugs instead of one is going to increase toxicities. But at the same time, it will give uh, a, a good efficacy for this patient population. We have some data on giving alpelisib post CDK46 inhibitor. And the results are not any more impressive than what we saw with Elisestrant. So I think we just have to make a decision as clinicians which one to give and uh, whether we want to give monotherapy or combination therapy. And hopefully we can give both uh, sequentially. Talking particularly about the side effects, I know the Alpelisib, as you mentioned, uh, hyperglycemia, diarrhea. Uh, when utilizing Elisestrant, any pearls for overall toxicity and uh, managing these side effects with it? So Alicestrant was actually pretty easy to, to give. The major issues ended up being some GI, meaning a little bit of nausea, and that was really it. But if you look at the use of antiemetics, there was less antiemetic used on the Alicestrant arm than on, a, on the aromatase inhibitor arm. And that's interesting because if you ask oncologists, does, uh, does an aromatase inhibitor cause nausea? The answer is going to be, no, not really. And, and so if you translate that to Elisestrant, you should, you should answer the exact same thing. Now, we'll see when we start using it in clinical practice whether we have a different um, sense of what the toxicity profile is. Because a lot of these drugs, when we start using them in cl clinical practice, we start realizing other things. Right. But on the clinical trial, it was actually pretty well tolerated. And I think from our side, as a general medical oncologist, those are the things. How comfortable are we giving a drug? What's the benefit? And now this is oral, so patients can take this at home. So a lot of things for us to be excited when it comes to LSSTRIN. As a community oncologist, Rahul, of course, we are sort of used to managing these side effects. So it sort of comes off and it, at an ease. And now you add the comfort of taking it orally, while fulvestrin, on the other hand, was intramuscular shot. So. Yeah, the other thing to keep in mind is that uh, there is a companion diagnostic, uh, and that's the GARDEN360 test. Obviously, we've had companion diagnostics with a lot of other drugs we have approved, and we can still use other tests to, 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 to find the, the right patient population. But based on FDA approval, there is a companion diagnostic for it. Well, this is some exciting data we have, and uh, we are looking forward for many more approvals, but this at least adds on to another treatment option for our patient population. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Kaklamani, and congratulations for being part of this trial and leading on to the FDA approval. 
Thank you so much. It's interesting to realize that the last endocrine therapy we had approved for breast cancer was back in 2005. So <laughs> we had to, to wait uh, almost 20 years for the next approval when we got there. Wow, what an exciting discussion. That was very nice of Dr. Kaklamani to cover that. And uh, I feel like this is exciting time all over. We continue to say that in breast oncology and lung, but it truly is with so many uh, drug approvals. So what do you think were the takeaways from the discussion today, Rahul, especially when applying to community practice? Yeah, Rohit, personally, I had not realized that it's been almost 20 years since the last endocrine treatment approval. A few That's things crazy. to reiterate from my point of view is that maybe liquid biopsy perhaps is better uh, rather than chasing the tissue in this particular setting when you're looking for a resistant mutation. Um, the other thing is, I think that this drug certainly gives us a new treatment option, but we need to better define who is endocrine sensitive. Um, we brought up that 12 months is as good as 18 months. Are there some patients that might benefit even if they've had six to 12 months? So I really think that we need to get better in defining and selecting those patients. And from my perspective, I'm eagerly looking forward to some combination trials because this sets a good foundation and a proof of concept. But I really think we need to do better as well. No, I think you bring up great points. And I feel like the more important thing in all this is uh, that this option is available orally especially when you talk about these patients are going through so much and as an oral agent being an option. And on top of that, the side effect profile didn't look too concerning. Sure, there are GI related side effects, but in community, I think we are very much used to managing them with a lot of our patients. Yeah, no, uh, you're absolutely correct. The side effects seem very manageable. And if anything, we've learned during pandemic is how fast can we pivot some of these things from not bringing our patients to keeping them home and trying to keep their treatment at home. So this certainly gives us an option. I'm looking forward to how this field continues to change. Certainly, I think it's just the start of uh, the oral surge uh, timeline here, but the future looks exciting. Well, thanks for joining us for this discussion today. We hope to continue to provide you with practice changing information and updates.